Starship launches, but fails to reach orbit. Juice looks back at Earth one last time. And Gaia helps find an exoplanet. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. I'm recording this on Thursday, and today was the day that the SpaceX Starship and Super Heavy were going to blast off from Boca Chica, Texas, and head off into orbit and complete the entire launch stack and demonstrate that the era of a fully reusable two stage rocket is here. We got partway there. <laughs> so uh, there was a delay on Monday. So that's when it was originally supposed to launch. And I guess there was a bunch of issues that engineers needed to fix. And so they rescheduled for 420 today. And right on time today, the rocket blasted off and it was epic. Like that is a monster rocket. It is twice as powerful as a Saturn V rocket. And it blasted off the Raptor two engines, carried it up about three minutes into flight, just as it was trying to do the separation of the Starship from the super heavy booster there was a problem. They didn't separate. The speed stopped going up. It hit about 2000 kilometers per hour and then just stopped going up. And then you could see there was like a spiral going on with the rocket. And a few seconds after that, the whole thing came apart and exploded and debris rained down. So, okay, so super heavy worked. Um, the separation didn't work. And really the, like the big unknown here is will Starship be able to return safely from orbit? Will that heat shield system work? We don't know yet. Now, everyone at SpaceX and Elon Musk put this in the best possible light. Their goal was to just clear the tower and then anything after that would be a bonus. But obviously everybody wanted this thing to fly to orbit and to test out the other parts of the technology stack. So we're going to have to wait for that to happen. Now, we're recording this, like I'm just recording this just a couple of hours after the launch attempt. And so I don't have any answers. I just have a lot of questions. So I think this week, I'm just going to post a bunch of questions. What failed? How come all of the Raptor engines didn't ignite? Why did it fail to separate? Why was it spinning? Uh, so many questions. So like, I would just have to let these questions hang in the air. And then next week, hopefully we'll have a whole bunch of answers and we'll be able to do a follow up episode where we try to answer some of Fraser's questions from the previous week. One thing as well is that that is a really powerful rocket and it caused a mess at the launch site. So you can see there's this giant crater underneath the launch. So they're going to need some kind of flame diverter to carry all of that energy away from the launch tower. I can't imagine how many launches you're going to get with it carving out a bigger and bigger crater with every launch. Like this is going to be a fully sustainable, reusable launch platform. It needs to be able to hold up to the enormous energy. So congratulations to everyone at SpaceX for this first test flight. Congrats to getting off the launch pad. And I look forward to the future tests when this thing finally goes to orbit and we get that big unknown. Will Starship be able to survive reentry? What is the future for New Horizons? New Horizons is one of my favorite spacecraft. It launched back in 2006. It made an epic flyby of Jupiter, gave us some really amazing pictures of Jupiter and its moons, especially Io. You can see these volcanoes on Io. Then about 10 years later, it made a flyby of Pluto. And like the first time, like, like for all of the solar system, we had these really cool pictures of all of the planets, even Uranus and Neptune. And then Pluto was like an artist impression or a blurry picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. There's like, what is that? Is that a crater maybe? Um, and with New Horizons, we got the first pictures of Pluto and its moon Charon. And then New Horizons carried on and gave us the first close up pictures of a Kuiper Belt object with Arakoth. And New Horizons is still doing great. I mean, it is way out 
into the Kuiper Belt, and it's going to be traveling through the Kuiper Belt probably until 2027-2028. And Alan Stern, principal investigator of New Horizons, says it has enough propellant in the tank to see at least one more object, maybe another one. And the Vera Rubin Observatory is coming online later this year, next year, it's going to be scanning the sky, and it will have such a deep resolution that it's going to be able to find other Kuiper Belt objects. And if everything works out well, we could see some new targets for New Horizons. But maybe you won't get a chance to fly to them. So we've got some great reporting on Universe Today, thanks to Carolyn Collins Peterson. Uh, and the scuttlebutt is that NASA is considering to remove some of New Horizons budget, shift it from being a planetary science mission to a heliospheric mission. In other words, it's going to be studying the the way the sun solar wind interacts with interstellar space, like the Voyager spacecraft are doing right now and the pioneers did before that, and it will no longer be a planetary science mission, even though it's perfectly capable of finding them. Now, obviously, time is running out. And the New Horizons team has asked for budget to be able to continue looking for and even explore other planetary missions as well as continue to send back data and crunch all of the discoveries that it's made so far. And so we could see that it could have some of its funding cut, it could be shifted its priorities over to heliospheric science. And this could mean that we might not see more observations from New Horizons in the future. So we'll keep you posted. Juice looks back at Earth. All right, last week, we talked about the launch of ESA's Juice spacecraft. This is the mission It's going to be flying to the Jovian moons, it's going to be doing observations of Europa and Callisto. And especially it's going to be sticking around Ganymede and doing a ton of observations at Ganymede. It just launched last week, but it has to make multiple flybys of other planets in the solar system to build up the speed to be able to get out to Jupiter. So it's going to be doing a flyby of Venus, a flyby of Earth, and it won't arrive at Jupiter until 2031. But we got one really cool set of pictures as juice was flying away from Earth. Now it's got these tiny cameras on board that are used really to help keep track of its deployments. And so it was making sure that its solar panels were deploying correctly and other scientific instruments on it. But you got Earth photobombing these pictures that it was taking of itself. So you got these selfies by juice with the Earth in the background. And like this is going to be one of the last things that we see from juice for a couple of years until it starts to make those first flybys. Now this isn't the main science camera on the spacecraft. Like I said, these are just these small operational cameras. And so hopefully when it does its flybys of Venus and Earth, we'll get the high resolution images in preparation for it arriving at Jupiter in 2031. A neutron star acts like a mini quasar. So some of the largest black holes in the universe, the supermassive black holes, these can have millions, even billions of times the mass of the sun. And as they're actively feeding on material gas and dust and stars and planets and spaceships, they create this giant accretion disk around it sort of like swirling material that's waiting to go into the maw of the black hole. And with all of this ionized material, these really powerful magnetic fields whip up and surround the accretion disk. And then these powerful winds can blow away from the supermassive black hole out into space. And one of the big questions that astronomers have is like, what impact do these winds have on the galaxies that are are around them, you know, is all of this material blasting out affecting other nearby galaxies? Is it raining back down onto the galaxy and affecting star formation, seeding heavier elements into the galaxy? And now astronomers have found an example of a quasar, but in miniature, they found a neutron star that is just a few thousand light years away from us in the Milky Way. But this neutron star is feeding on material from a companion star, it's got this accretion disk, the accretion disk has built up this magnetic field, and it's blowing out winds that are going about 250 to 800 kilometers per second. And it just looks like a scaled down version of a quasar. And yet it's close enough that astronomers can study it directly. And the question is like, what is the future of this star? I mean, a neutron star is already very dense. And as it is accreting material from its companion object, it's eventually going to cross some kind of limit. So is it going to turn into a black hole in the future? Will it have some kind of 
Nova, where this material blasts off of it again. It's interesting, both as a model of a quasar, but also like what the future holds for a neutron star that is feeding on a companion. Webb sees a galactic merger. All right, it's time for your JWST image of the week. And uh, it's funny because people always ask me like, how come we don't see a lot of pictures from JWST? And like, we're sharing at least one picture a week here on Space Bites and have been doing so for almost a year now. So if you need more of JWST in your eyeballs, just make sure you subscribe to our channel. But this picture is called ARP 220. And it looks like just one gigantic galaxy blob, but it is two separate spiral galaxies that are crashing into each other. And this merger is so perfect that the cores of the two galaxies are only about 1200 light years apart from each other. And they're on a collision course with each other. I don't know if they'll merge this time around, but the merger is inevitable at this point. And because of all of this gas and dust that's crashing into each other, it's getting really hot, especially in the infrared spectrum. So you can see this invisible light, but in infrared, it's just astoundingly bright. And just to give you a sense, like it is shining with about 100 times as much luminosity as the Milky Way would if you were looking at it from an outside observer. And I think what's really stunning about this picture is that you're seeing that classic JWST diffraction spikes from a galaxy. Like normally you see these when you have like a really bright star or some other object in the picture, but this is like a whole big wide galaxy. And yet it is so bright, overwhelming JWST sensors that you're getting those diffraction spikes even at this point. So it is just an epic merger. Now I bring up a lot of space news here on the channel and I'm sure you have questions. Well, good news. I'm glad to answer your questions. Every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, we do the QA show where I answer your questions live. The show lasts for about an hour and a half, and then we edit that down and that becomes the QAs that are released every week. So if you want to see the results of questions that people have asked about space, astronomy, rockets, mostly Lagrange points, you definitely should check out the QAs. And if you want to join live, we do that every Monday at 5 p.m. And there should be an event somewhere here on the channel. So come hang out and ask your questions. I'm, I can't wait to answer them. And of course, we've done hundreds of QAs. I think at the time I'm recording this, 221 in the playlist. So if you just want to just watch question after question after question, you can. Gravitational waves could let us look inside the sun. Now, as you probably know, I'm always looking at various astronomical journals, conferences. I'm trying to find really cool ideas. Like the thing that I find most fascinating is when there's some problem in astronomy and then someone thinks of a really clever way to get an answer. And this story definitely counts. The idea comes from a team of Japanese researchers and they propose that as gravitational waves pass through the sun, the gravity of the sun will focus them. And by measuring the changes in the gravitational waves, they should be able to get a sense of the interior structure of the sun. And they propose that pulsars are going to be the perfect objects to be able to track these gravitational waves. And they even identified three pulsars that they think are nicely lined up so they can be watched before they pass behind the sun, and then during the time when they've passed behind the sun. And then you can use gravitational wave observatories to track the gravitational waves coming from these pulsars, and then use that to reconstruct the interior of the sun. It's a very clever idea. Just the kind of thing that I like to find. Check out this tornado on the sun. Now, one of my favorite astrophotographers is Andrew McCarthy. And if you haven't already, definitely follow his Twitter feed and check out his website. And he is like, he's the best in the business. And he has this incredible telescope setup, but he also has a really impressive technique. And he will just record a ridiculous amount of pictures to be able to create some of these mosaics that he's made. He's done amazing mosaics of the sun in the past, the moon and lots of other objects in the night sky. And one of his newest pictures kind of takes the cake. And this is an image of a prominence rising up from the surface of the sun. And not just an image, he actually recorded a video of this thing. Just to give you a sense of scale, this thing is about 14 times as big as the Earth you could stack 
14 Earths on top of each other. And that's what you're looking at. For this project, he collaborated with another astrophotographer named Jason Gunzel. For each frame of the video, Andrew recorded about 500 separate images, and then he stacked them up to create one image. And then he stitched those images together to create this video. So that's the kind of dedication that Andrew has. Gaia finds a planet. When astronomers find exoplanets, they have two main techniques. There's the radio velocity technique where they measure the wobble in starlight as the star is being pulled back and forth by its planet. They also use the transit method where they watch as the planet passes in front of the star, dimming it slightly. And there's a few other techniques to be able to find planets, but they haven't found very many so far. But one really exciting way to find planets is using astrometry. And so time to talk about Gaia again. Now the Gaia mission is tracking the motion and positions of stars in the sky with such accuracy that it's able to actually watch this tiny little spiral in the sky as a planet is yanking at its star with its gravity. And so astronomers were looking through all of the Gaia data and they found what looked like a potential planet. Then they did follow up observations with the Subaru telescope and they imaged the planet directly. The planet has about 14 to 16 times the mass of Jupiter and it orbits about three times farther from its star than Jupiter does. So it's a very big planet. It's orbiting very far from its star, the kind of thing that a telescope like Subaru is able to capture. And like at this point, astronomers have only seen about 20 planets directly, even though they've detected thousands and thousands of them indirectly. Now we've only gotten the third data release from Gaia. And so the fourth data release, the one that's coming out in the next couple of years is going to be the one that will probably deliver the treasure trove of planets. It's going to have five and a half years of accumulated data that astronomers will be able to look through. And they'll be looking for those little spirals from the stars throughout all of that data for the billion plus stars that Gaia has been observing. And what's really effective about astrometry is that you can then see those planets that are orbiting their star face on or at different angles with the transit method, it's got to be perfectly lined up with the radio velocity, it's got to be roughly lined up. You can really only detect about 1% of planets using the transit method or the radio velocity method. But with astrometry, you could detect them at varying angles. And so you can imagine a future super Gaia mission that's able to detect planets at different orientations, then pass that along to these super telescopes like the European Southern Observatory's extremely large telescope or Habex or something like that to be able to do direct observations of these planets. So it's a really powerful technique. And we're right at the very beginning of this starting to find many planets. But I wouldn't be surprised if in decades from now, the vast majority of the planets that we know about were discovered using the astrometry technique, like with Gaia. Now there's another way to detect planets, and that is finding them based on their magnetospheres. As a star gives off a flare, the flare interacts with the planet. If the planet has a magnetosphere, it puts out this flash of radio waves and astronomers detected that for the first time in the last couple of weeks. I've got an interview with Dr. Joe Pesk, who is a program director at the National Science Foundation and talked about this discovery using ALMA and what the future holds for searching for planets and their magnetospheres. All right, those are all the stories that we had today. Of course, we've got links to every story in the show notes down below. So if you want to find out more, you can begin your rabbit hole journey there. You can get even more space news on my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word. There are no ads and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at university.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent and keeps ads at a bare minimum. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Jay Dennis, David Giltonen, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz who support us. 
at the master of the universe level. All your support means the universe to us. All right, that was all the news that we had today. We'll see you next week with some answers, I hope.